Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's a big pleasure to be talking here today at AGCT. Um, I mean, of course, uh, sadly, AGCTs uh, are not the same without uh, Gilles and without Alexei. And uh, I think about uh, Gilles Lachaud, there will be uh, more talks in the forthcoming days, so I won't, uh, uh, don't want to spend too much time on it. But let me just say, just by looking at uh, uh, audience here with um, all these people from different parts of France and different parts of the world where uh, I know that in most cases Gilles Lachaud has played uh, directly or indirectly uh, a role in their um, academic career. I think it's, uh, it's clear that he will be uh, deeply missed and, um, um, and he uh, oh, yeah. it's, um, he'll be missed as a friend as a and as a colleague. Um, so what I want to talk about today is basically about uh, recursive towers and uh, good recursive towers. Uh, so uh, as you all know, uh, curves over finite fields with many points uh, have been one of the uh, main themes of the AGCTs throughout the years. And there have been various approaches to those, but I'll be mainly focusing today about recursive towers, which is uh, kind of uh, the topic I have been working on uh, in, the, in the past. And um, I will try to give a, a kind of an overview of uh, what recursive towers are and uh, um, how, like, some more, uh, how we find them, how, what are important about them. And at the end, I will talk about uh, a recent joint result with Christoph Litzenthaler about uh, uh, good recursive towers over prime fields. Uh, okay, so let me start. Uh, so uh, I will not say too much about other uh, ways of constructing uh, uh, sequences of curves, uh, synthetic sequences of curves at many points, but I'll try to kind of hint at some of the connections. So uh, throughout the, co uh, throughout the uh, talk, C will always denote a smooth, projective, uh, absolutely irreducible curve. Uh, over uh, a finite field FQ with Q elements. Uh, alternatively, you could talk about algebraic function fields in one variables having constant field FQ, but I'll try to kind of stick to the language of curves throughout the course, uh, throughout the uh, talk today. And for the theory of curves over finite fields, as you all know, one of the main results is the theorem of Hasse-Weyl, which basically states that the zeta function associated to such a curve satisfies the Riemann hypothesis. And as an immediate consequence of it, we get a, a good bound for uh, the number of rational points on such a curve, the Hasse-Weyl bound, which basically says that for such a curve, if you look at the number of rational points, if Q rational points, then it can be always upper bounded by Q plus one, where Q is the cardinality of the finite field, plus two times the genus of the curve times square root of Q. So the Hasse-Weyl bound uh, usually comes also together with a lower bound. It just tells you how much this number can somehow differ from Q plus one. But in um, my talk today, I'll be interested in the case where the genus tends to infinity or when, when we are looking at curves of uh, relatively large genus compared to the cardinality of the finite field. And in that case, the lower bound becomes uh, negative, which is uh, kind of becoming meaningless. Yeah? So I'll just state the upper bound for now. And uh, so this is, as I said, one of the strong bounds that we have for uh, curves, for the number of rational points on curves over finite fields. There are various improvements, but I think it's fair to say that if the genus of the curve is not too large, it is a quite good bound. Yeah? But what happens uh, for large genus curves is kind of different. So this was noticed by Ihara and by Manin uh, in the beginning of the 80s that if uh, the genus of the curve is large compared to the cardinality of the finite field, then the Hasse-Weyl bound is bad, which means it cannot be attained anymore. And um, then the question is, what are reasonable bounds for in this regime of uh, large genus curves, right? Uh, and um, to study that, Ihara introduced the following quantity. So it's now 
known as the Ihara constant. So for a given curve C over a finite field FQ, we look at the number of rational points. We look at the ratio to the genus of the curve. And we look at this quantity as we run over families of curves of increasing genus. Yeah? And all of those uh, curves should be defined over the same finite field FQ. Yeah, so this basically tells you, in comparison to the genus of the curve, for a large genus curve, what can you expect for the maximal number of points that you, what is the maximal number of points that you can expect? So this quantity just depends on the finite field Q, so it's denoted by uh, A of Q. Yeah? And uh, if you look at the Hasse-Weyl bound, if you fix your Q, and uh, you, you'll see that for large G, the first term, Q plus 1, will uh, kind of be not too important. And you see that the number of rational points can grow at most linearly in the genus, and the corresponding ratio is just 2 times square root of Q. So Hasse-Weyl bound implies directly that A of Q is upper bounded by 2 times square root of Q. But of course, by the result of Ihara we know, and Manin, we know that this could be improved for large genus curves, and that even gives you an asymptotic improvement. So if you look at what Ihara's result would give you, uh, it would give you something like roughly an improvement of order square root of Q2. Yeah, so A of Q can be roughly upper bounded by square root of uh, 2Q. That's a bit better, but uh, just for the... Uh, for, for to give you uh, an idea of the order of magnitude. And then the ideas of Ihara were developed uh, by Trinfeld and by Vladut. And they have shown that in general, uh, A of Q can always be upper bounded by square root of Q minus one. And as of today, this is still the best known upper bound we have for this quantity, uh, A of Q. Yeah. Okay, uh, so what about uh, lower bounds for A of Q? Uh, so how would you construct lower bounds, first of all? Or, or how would you obtain lower bounds? The, one of the ways, the only way used until now, is to construct in one way or another sequences of curves CI, each defined over a fixed finite field F of F F F Q, such that the genera of these curves tend to infinity. And so that if you look at the number of rational points on those curves, uh, in comparison to the genus, this ratio should tend to something uh, large. Yeah, so if you look at this limit as i tends to infinity, this should be large. This we usually denote by lambda. We call it the limit of the sequence, if it exists, of course. And if you have such a family of curves, such that uh, this quantity is large, or at least positive, then you immediately get a lower bound for A of Q, obviously. Uh, uh, but then the question is how to construct these curves which have many points and uh, compared to their genera, yeah? Okay, but finding such a, a, a sequence in one way or another gives you lower bounds. And of course, if you find a family where the limit is something positive, you get a non-trivial lower bound for A of Q. Such sequences we will call uh, good. And if you can find a sequence where uh, lambda is uh, as large as possible, so it would be, for instance, A of Q, then we will call it uh, optimal. But of course, we don't know the value of A of Q, so I mean, this kind of is a, a weird definition where we don't know what the right-hand side is, so sometimes instead of this, people just put the best known upper bound, namely the trinfeld flooded upper bound over here, yeah? Okay, but then the question is how to, how do you come up with such curves that have many points compared to their genera? Yeah. And uh, so I'm going to give a short overview of the known uh, results. Uh, Ser has shown using uh, class field towers, so using class field theory that in for any Q, A of Q is positive. In fact, uh, even more, it can be lower bounded by some uh, logarithmic uh, term in Q. Yeah? So there's an absolute constant C such that A of Q is uh, lower bounded by C times log of Q. So in any case, it is uh, positive. Yeah, so we have some quantity A of Q, which is in some sense universal. It's, you can attach it to any finite field. And we know it lies in any case uh, somewhere between square root of minus one and zero, and we know it is positive. Yeah? 
And then there have been various results for uh, other, for various small finite fields over F2, F3, and so on. So I'm not going to list them all, but uh, many of the people contributing to this are uh, in the audience, and I think there'll be more discussions about this later on. Uh, and then another lower bound is by Ihara, and independently by Zfassmann, Vladut, and Singh. And uh, the method used here is uh, uh, reductions of elliptic modular curves or of Shimura curves. And they have shown that in the case that Q is a square, so if it's a, a even power of a prime, so L is an arbitrary prime power, we take a square so we get a, a quadratic finite field, so to say. And the value of A of Q is known, and it's given as square root of Q minus one. Yeah, so it's just the quantity given by the Trinfat Vladut upper bound. Let me also mention, uh, I mean, since we are at AGCT and one of the C stands for coding theory, uh, one of the uh, uh, nice contributions of Svatsman, Vladut, and Singh was to show that using these curves that you construct, you can obtain uh, long codes that are, that are beating the gilbert Varshamov bound. Yeah, so you get some uh, uh, long linear codes which have very good relative parameters. Okay, so quadratic finite fields, those are the only cases where we really know the exact value of the Ihara constant. Uh, what else is known? Uh, for cubic finite fields, there's a result by various people, Sink, uh, Van der Heer, and Van der Flucht. And uh, Bezerra, Garcia, and Stichtenot. So this is in the case that Q is of the form L cubed, where L is again uh, a prime power, and the lower bound they obtained was A of uh, L cubed can be lower bounded by two times L squared minus one divided by L plus two. So what were the methods used here? Zink used the generations of Shimura surfaces, uh, and Van der Heer, Van der Flucht, and Pezera Garcia Stichtenot, they used explicit recursive towers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. And this uh, lower bound uh, on the right looks a bit mysterious, but I'll uh, tell you in a bit how it can be, I mean, in fact, I'll tell you right now how it can be kind of put together in a uniform way with the other lower bound we have for quadratic finite fields. Yeah. So the last thing I want to talk about is a joint result of myself together with Peter Belen, Arnaldo Garcia, and Henning Stichtenot. And this result holds for all finite fields except prime fields. So Q is of the form L to the power N, where N has to be at least two. And then for, for those non-prime finite fields, we have obtained the following lower bound for A of L to the N. I mean, we have the, just to compare, let me write the Drinfeld Vladut upper bound. It is just given as uh, L to the N over two minus one. That's the best known upper bound we have. And the lower bound, uh, I mean, that's the Drinfeld Vladut upper bound. And the lower bound we obtain is just a harmonic mean of two quantities. One of the quantities is a bit smaller than this, and one of them is a bit larger than this. Yeah? So this n over two is not the integer in general, so you have to once uh, round it down, uh, so you get a quantity that's a bit smaller than the Trinfeld Ladut bound, and you have to once round it up, you get a quantity a bit larger than the Trinfeld Ladut bound, and if you take the harmonic mean of those two quantities, that will give you a lower bound. So you see already it's at the kind of the right uh, order of magnitude. Uh, so what's the harmonic mean? Just to recall, it's just given by uh, two divided by the sum of the reciprocals of the two quantities we have over there, n over two minus one, and L to the power, uh, the floor of n over two minus one. Yeah. I wrote them in the opposite order, but it doesn't matter. 
Okay, so one thing to notice about that is if uh, n is a square, uh, then, uh, so if, if q is a square, so if n is even, you see that you do not really need those floor and ceilings over here. So you just get the harmonic mean of root l minus one and root l minus one. So you recover uh, the Ihara uh, svasman bladut sink result. And if uh, n uh, is divisible by three, so if you are in the case of a cubic finite field, then uh, you just recover this mysterious quantity given by this uh, sink bound over there. And for all other uh, finite fields, the, except prime fields, you still get a, a kind of good uh, lower bound. And what, uh, what was the idea? In fact, one can obtain this result in two different ways. One way is to use uh, uh, recursive towers. That's what I will be talking about today, not only in, this, in the context of this result, but in general. And another way uh, to obtain this result is to uh, consider Trinfeld modular varieties and, you look, and to look at particular curves lying on those Trinfeld modular varieties. Yeah. Okay, and let me also just mention that, uh, I mean, just as uh, the result over the quadratic field, finite field gives you uh, long codes beating the Gilbert Weishamo bound for Q at least bigger than 49 and the square, uh, using this lower bound, you can construct uh, um, codes uh, uh, over all non prime finite fields that beat the Gilbert Weishamo bound as long as Q is, a non, is not a prime, so it's a prime power and uh, it's bigger than 49. And uh, for 125, it does not work somehow. Yeah? So you, go, you are beating using these curves, you can uh, beat the Gilbert Weishamo bound uh, for uh, Q uh, non prime. Uh, and Q bigger than 49, but Q 125 does not work, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that's kind of the uh, uh, rough um, overview of the scenery. So that you see there are various methods of uh, coming up with these sequences of curves with many points. And I'll be talking today about uh, recursive towers. Uh, so, yes, sure. <laughs> That's a good question. So my guess is, so my hope is that it is this, because then <laughs> it would be <laughs> the best possible. But my guess is, in fact, that the right value would be the trend valve loaded upper bound. That's kind of my feeling. But um, I mean, I talked to other people, and I asked them what they think. Uh, Winnie Lee told me, for instance, that uh, she thinks that this is kind of the main term, but you always have to add something logarithmic to it. And uh, if you look at this for prime fields, I mean, this is not the result valid for prime fields, but if you would pretend you are in a prime field, this would just give you zero. And then uh, kind of uh, the idea was when this, the main term is zero, you're just left with something logarithmic, which is kind of recovering all the results over prime fields that have logarithmic lower bounds in Q. I mean, but I kind of feel that uh, we can still work harder and reach trend five loudout in each case. <laughs> but that remains to be seen. <laughs> Hopefully in forthcoming AGCTs uh, we'll know more. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about um, explicit recursive towers. And uh, I mean, one advantage of explicit recursive towers is that they're explicit. So in principle, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this while there's a video recording, but those curves and the codes constructed from them, I don't think in practice they are used really. I don't know, maybe someone else can say something about that. But uh, so if you really at some point want to use those codes constructed from those curves, it's good to have equations for the curves. And that's difficult once you are looking at class field towers or uh, curves lying on uh, Trinfeld modular varieties or um, other kind of Shimura curves and so on. But if you have explicitly recursively given uh, curves, you explicitly know their equations and you can really implement them. Yeah. So that's one of the um, advantages. Another advantage would be uh, those are much more accessible. Yeah. You just Everyone can write down equations of curves and you can understand what they mean. Yeah? 
but I mean, you lose kind of the uh, intuition of what's going on, but I'm try I'll try today to show you some common feature in all of those good examples of recursive towers that uh, kind of show that there is in fact some structure behind them. So, um, so the idea of explicit recursive towers uh, uh, goes back to the 90s and I think it was first Feng who kind of tried to uh, construct curves using such a recursive machinery. Um, he did not really succeed, but uh, this uh, idea was picked up by uh, Pelikan, who came up with some equations which turned out to be the right equations at the end, but uh, uh, I don't know what the exact story is, but uh, then he communicated this to uh, Arnaldo Garcia and Henning Stichtenhout, and then they generalized those equations and uh, did all the genus calculations and so on, and they came up with the first uh, proof of uh, uh, a sequence of curves that perform good asymptotically, yeah? given by explicit equations. Yeah? That, that was in the middle of the 90s. And the main ingredient is in fact quite simple. You basically have two curves. Let me call them C0 and C minus one. They are both defined over the finite field FQ. And in most cases uh, that we know, uh, they are just P1. Yeah? So you have two copies of the projective line. And we'll have two morphisms. Uh, let me call them F and G from C0 to uh, C minus one. Yeah, and that's the, all the ingredients that you have, uh, that you need to have to construct your tower. How would you come up with your tower? So what you basically do is, uh, maybe I'll draw it over here. Uh, so you have your curve C0, you take two copies, you have two different maps, let's say one with F, one with G, to C minus one, then you can take the fiber product of these two curves over C minus one. Yeah? So the fiber product will give you a new curve, uh, C1, and then you kind of uh, do this iteratively. Yeah? So starting with this C0 and another copy of C0 here, you again have the same maps F and G to C minus one, and you can take the fiber product, you get the same curve, the is an isomorphic curve C1 over here. So you repeat this at the base several times, all these maps, F and G, and here you have those uh, C1s. And then you see here, you, can, you now have a, a correspondence uh, over C0. So you can take the fiber product of C1 and C1 over C0. So here you get C2, and similarly here you get an isomorphic copy of C2 and then you can just go on like this. Yeah? And let me just add here one more copy of C minus uh, one. You see on the left hand side, you'll obtain uh, a sequence of uh, curves. And this is kind of uh, what we call the, X, the recursive tower defined by these two curves and the corresponding coverings over there. Yeah? But then the question is, I mean, as I said, in most cases, C0 and C minus one are taken to be just a projective line, but you could take something uh, more uh, complicated if you want. But then the question is what to choose as maps over here that you want to use to iterate, yeah? Maybe, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it does not need to be irreducible at this point. Yeah, so, so basically, uh, let me write it down. So they don't even need to be smooth. So uh, I'm going to talk about that. So C1 will be basically consisting uh, of uh, tuples PQ from C0 squared for such that G of Q is equal to F of P. Yeah, and uh, in general, uh, these curves might not be reducible. They will, in most cases, will not be even smooth. And, but what I'll do is I will uh, kind of try to find um, uh, uh, morphisms here. So that, uh, uh, first of all, these curves, they will have some uh, irreducible component of increasing genus that has many points. And I will, of course, rather than taking these curves, I will take their normalizations and as the maps, I will just take the induced covers that you have between the normalizations. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
I mean, uh, in general, CM uh, would be uh, just a sequence of points P0, PM, in C0 to the M plus one, such that uh, G of PI is equal to F of PI minus one for uh, I running from one to M. Yeah, it's clear, okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, but I will take their normalizations and uh, they will. Yeah, but they might, the, the components might give you absolutely irreducible curves. Yeah, <laughs> okay, and the question is, in fact, when can you ensure that they are irreducible? And uh, how can you choose maps F and G so that uh, kind of the, you get a sequence where you have many points and the genus does not grow too fast, hopefully, yeah? Okay, um, so those are the kind of uh, questions to ask, so how to find uh, maps F and G so that uh, you could, by just looking at the components if necessary, get sequences of curves that have many points and so that the genus does not uh, grow too fast. Okay, um, I want to kind of give you one uh, example to show you how uh, kind of such a recursive construction uh, comes very naturally. Uh, and that's kind of uh, also uh, important. So I'll give you the example of uh, recursively given uh, modular curves. Uh, and it's kind of also an important example because as I will t try to explain later, it's believed that uh, in fact all um, such special coverings that give you uh, a good sequence have to have some uh, modular interpretation. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so just as a very important example, so I'll uh, fix a prime L and we consider the curves, consider uh, the sequence of modular curves x naught L to the n. So uh, I, I just uh, take as levels powers uh, of the same prime. So n runs over all the natural numbers. Um, so uh, these curves uh, are known to have uh, many rational points when, re uh, when reduced at the prime uh, not dividing L, so at a prime P different from L. But uh, Elkis has shown that in fact uh, these sequences of curves can be given in a recursive manner as I uh, explained over there. Yeah? So that's kind of why I uh, want to give this particular example. So uh, what, what, what do points on, on these modular curves correspond to. So if you take a point that's not a cusp, so if you take a point on, let's say, y0 l to the n, so a point on x0 l to the n, which is not a cusp, then we know that uh, this will correspond to uh, an elliptic curve together with a cyclic subgroup of order uh, l to the n, right? Or alternatively, we could say it corresponds to an elliptic curve E together with an isogeny uh, having a kernel isomorphic to C uh, L to the N, to the cyclic group of order uh, L to the N. So it corresponds to such a cyclic isogeny, um, any point. And then, uh, as you know, for, uh, for a cyclic group of order L to the N, you have a very natural uh, filtration uh, into subgroups, right? So you have C L to the N, which contains uh, C L to the N minus one, and so on, up to CL. And corresponding to this filtration, you will get a, a chain of isogenies, right? So you have your elliptic curve E, you'll have a L isogeny to E modulus CL, you'll have another L isogeny to E modulus uh, L squared, and so on. And lastly, an L isogeny to E modulus L to the n, yeah? So let me give these new names. Let me call this curve E0, this curve E1, this elliptic curve E2, and so on, up to uh, En over here. Uh, so that's kind of uh, 
uh, but a point on this modular curve uh, of level L to the N would, co would correspond to, it would consist of an elliptic curve together with the chain of L isogenies. Yeah? But then uh, you already see kind of the recursive uh, structure in this picture. What you could do is you could go uh, two steps at a time. Right? So you can look at these sequences of two steps that you can, uh, uh, that you can go. So uh, if you take a point on y0 l to the n, which corresponds to uh, such a chain of isogenies, you can in fact associate to it a sequence of uh, such triples of elliptic curves together with these uh, two L isogenies. Yeah? So you can, uh, you get a map from a, uh, y0 L to the n to y0 L squared to the power n minus one. And what you do is basically the sequence E0 up to E n, you just map onto uh, the n minus one tuple uh, E0, E1, E2, uh, E1, E2, E3, and so on, all the way up to E n minus two, E n minus one, uh, E n, yeah. And uh, you see, in fact, uh, you cannot take here any n minus one tuple of such sequences, but you have to have some nice patching condition, right? You, here we have that the uh, final part of this coincides with the initial part here, the final part here, so these last two curves with the isogeny have to uh, match with the next part over there. Yeah? Okay. Okay, and this kind of gives you the correspondence that I have uh, talked about over there. So if you look at x naught L squared, you can have two different maps to x naught of L, right? On the one hand, so this will correspond to such a sequence of E0, E1, E2 connected with L isogenies. You can, on one hand, map it onto E0, E1. Uh, together with the cyclic L isogeny or to uh, E1, E2. And kind of this uh, uh, condition here that in this N minus one tuple, uh, these uh, uh, somehow patch nicely together that uh, this part here agrees with this part over here so that at the end you get a nice chain starting at E0 going to En just corresponds to saying that uh, if you look at uh, that picture over there, so you have x naught of L squared, uh, you have these two different maps and that would just correspond to uh, the corresponding fiber product over here. So here you would have, uh, let me call maybe uh, this map F and this map G. So you would want that the image of F, which would mean you take, or uh, I should do it the opposite way, I'm sorry, this should be F, this should be G. You would want that uh, you take uh, such sequences such that if you take the uh, first part of this, it should, the, the last part of this, it should agree with the first part of this map over here. And then you would be kind of constructing uh, these uh, L cubed and so on in a recursive manner, yeah? Okay, and you know that after reduction modulo prime not dividing um, the, the level, you will have many points coming basically from the super singular uh, points on those curves, yeah? Okay, so this was just to say that, uh, in fact, uh, looking at those recursively uh, defined towers is something very natural. Yeah? Um, but then the question is, I mean, so modular curves will give you equations that will uh, behave that will uh, behave nicely, but how can you come up with other equations? How can you come up with other maps, f and g, that give you a nice uh, asymptotic behavior? It has been a very difficult question, so people have been looking for ways of finding nice covers and so on. 
And then people came up with new equations, and uh, what happened was that in each case, Elkis has shown that uh, for the sequences of curves they obtained, there is some higher reason why they behave nicely. So there is some uh, modular reason behind, there is some modular uh, interpretation, so to say, of what's going on there. And this is something he, he didn't call it a conjecture, he called it uh, fantasia. He just said that if you take any recursive tower, which is optimal, which behaves uh, good in a, uh, a symptotic sense, then there should be some higher reason why it exists. It should be in some sense modular. So that's kind of known as uh, Elkis fantasia, saying every optimal recursive tower is modular. Yeah. Okay, so um, now I want to kind of, uh, uh, after I hope I could convince you that those are natural objects, I want to show uh, how you can kind of, if you forget about the modular world, how you can come up with uh, kind of reasons, uh, how you can come up with good such maps. Yeah? Uh, what would you look for when you are to choose these maps F and G so that things behave very nicely? So uh, you have to uh, have uh, two things satisfied. I mean, first of all, you need, of course, that these maps uh, give you sequences uh, of curves or of things that have uh, irreducible components that are curves of increasing G. Uh, that's one thing. You will want to have many points on them, many rational points, and you will want that the genus uh, of this sequence does not grow too fast. Yeah? So uh, let me denote by uh, pi m the map from cm to c minus 1. And uh, so the first thing is how do you ensure that you have many points? That's the first thing. How this is done is, in fact, so here you have from level m to level minus 1, you have the map pi m. And uh, in all cases that I know of uh, good uh, towers, what happens is that you, here you have some rational points which split under all those coverings pi m, yeah? which means uh, if you look at the inverse image under pi m, you will only get rational points, uh, and the number of rational points will be exactly equal to the degree of the corresponding covering. Yeah? Uh, so that would be, for instance, a sufficient condition to have many points. Would be there are points uh, in C minus 1, FQ, so there are rational points down there which split under the map pi m from uh, C m to C minus 1 for all m. Yeah, that would be one way of uh, uh, kind of ensuring that you have uh, many points. So now let's try to see what this would mean uh, in terms of the covers F and G. What this would mean in terms of the covers F and G. So one way you could ensure this would be if you take a point here that is to be uh, splitting in all those extensions, you could ask for it. So what I want to do is, so uh, this graph is kind of called the pyramid associated uh, to the tower that you obtain on the left-hand side of the pyramid, right? And basically the idea of using this pyramid is to kind of say everything you want to say in this asymptotic sequence over here by just looking at what happens down here. Yeah? So you just want to look at this uh, P1, P1, and the two maps down here. Yeah? So if you want to have a point that splits completely, how you could ensure that would be you take a point that splits over here so that if you look at the images under F of the inverse images under G, they should again split in this extension, in this covering over here. Yeah? Because if the image here splits in this covering, the inverse image here will have to split over here. Yeah? So basically what you want is you want rational points here that split under this map G so that their image, the image of their inverse images under F, uh, again split in this uh, uh, extension over there. Yeah? So you want, for instance, you could ask for 
the existence. So there is uh, a set uh, S, let's say, consisting of uh, the, some of the rational points of the bottom curve, such that if you take uh, any point from S, uh, it should split in the map G from C0 to C minus one. That's one condition. And you would want that if you take one of the inverse images, so if you look at uh, G inverse of P, and if you push them down by F, uh, this should again lie inside, uh, this should again lie inside your set S, and hence it should split again. Yeah, so the set S should consist only of splitting points, and if you go up and down again towards the right, you should land inside the same set. Yeah, so this is kind of what is called to be forward complete. So we'll say the set S is forward complete. If you start in S and you go towards the right, you still always land in S. Yeah, so and this would ensure that uh, any point in S would split in the whole tower for all maps pi m, right? So this would in particular uh, imply that if you look at the number of rational points of the curve of at level m, it will be lower bounded by the cardinality of S, the number of the points uh, that split, times the degree of the map, of the map pi m. Yeah, so you can kind of, if you have such a S, you have first of all ensured that uh, the number of rational points uh, kind of uh, grows linearly in the degree of the corresponding maps. Yeah? Okay, so that's how you would have uh, one way to obtain uh, many, Okay, that would be one way of obtaining many points. And uh, another thing that you want to control is the genus. You want that the genera of the sequence of curves in, uh, should not grow too fast, so that the ratio of the number of rational points to the genera tends to something positive, yeah? So in most cases, what will happen is the, uh, you will have uh, a point here which will be totally ramified in all the tower. Yeah? So it's kind of a technical thing that I didn't want to say. So if you have a totally ramified point, you will know that they will all be irreducible. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I should have said that word. But I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the thing is there are some towers where there is no, um, totally splitting point, but in that case you have an irreducible component, uh, you know that, of increasing genus with many points. Yeah, so it's a bit technical, so I didn't want to kind of, uh, but uh, yeah, you're right in pointing out, so it's, uh, yeah, so I, yeah, yeah, that would be another way, that's, <laughs> is, yeah, I could have done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Uh, yes, hasn't stated the theory, so you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Uh, so let me assume, let's say, uh, that there is a totally ramified point, and then the theorem that I'm going to state at the end there will be one. Yeah. Okay, so uh, to kind of estimate the genus, what you use is you basically look at the riemann hurwitz formula, right? So you consider the covering pi m from cm to c minus one. You, you look at the uh, ramification here and try to uh, estimate from the ramification behavior in those maps the genera of all of those uh, uh, 
uh, curves that you have over there, yeah? And again, uh, one way to ensure that the genus does not grow too much is, I mean, here you have an infinite sequence uh, of curves, and a priori there could be infinitely many points that eventually split in this tower, right? But what we want is that, only that eventually ramify somewhere in the tower. But what we want to ensure is that uh, uh, down here, you can find a finite set of points that uh, uh, you can contain, uh, you can find a finite set that contain all the points that at any given point might possibly ramify. Yeah? So that would be kind of a way of ensuring that the genus does not grow too fast. Yeah? So a sufficient condition, again, um, would be to find uh, to, to ask that there are uh, only finitely many points in the bottom curve uh, which ramify in some uh, pi m. And so the kind of uh, all the ramification is restricted to a finite set of points. Uh, and of course, uh, in characteristic P, you might have uh, like uh, cases where the ramification is very bad, right? You might have a very big different exponent and so on. So you want kind of that the ramification is in some sense weak. It should be tame or at least uh, uh, different in each case should be bounded by the ramification index, yeah? So you ask for some uh, weakness of ramification, which basically means that if you take any point that uh, at some point ramifies, then the corresponding different exponent should be uh, uh, somehow bounded by a constant times the ramification index, yeah? Okay, uh, so how would you ensure that on the picture? Again, you can exploit the fact that you have a recursive structure, so you have lots of symmetries. If you can control well what happens at the bottom step, you have a good control of what happens as you go up here. Yeah? So if you have a point here that eventually ramifies at some point over here, then you know that the image under the sequences of maps down here will give you a point that has to ramify over here. Yeah? So if a point down here ramifies eventually, it will ramify in one of those extensions, in one of those map uh, coverings over here. And uh, then you could ask that anything that ramifies here should, once you trace back, and see where you might have possibly started here, uh, land in a finite set. Yeah? So if I have a finite set of points that contain all the ramified ones and that are uh, kind of uh, invariant or that are uh, undergoing now towards the left by taking like inverse image under F and down by G again, if you have such a finite set containing all uh, the ramified points that is, so to say, backwards complete, you would have ensured that there are only finitely many points here that ramify at some level. Yeah? Okay, again, this would be just uh, one way of uh, ensuring it. Yeah? So you want to have um, that there is a finite set Let me call it R at the bottom, such that the following holds. So uh, R contains all uh, the ramified points of the covering G to from C0 to C minus 1. And uh, R should be backwards complete. Yeah. Uh, so I forgot to say here, maybe, I'm sorry about that, I should have, uh, rather than writing P here, I should have used S, right? And similarly here, in this case, since you want it to be 
kind of a left invariant undergoing towards the left. You want that if you go up by uh, f, so if you look at f inverse r and down by g, you should again land inside r. Yeah, so this is what we will call uh, backwards complete. And then um, this uh, um, finding f and g so that you have splitting points that are forward complete and that you have a finite set containing all the ramified points that are backwards complete is kind of the main ingredient that you want to have. Yeah? So here you will have also some weakness assumption that you need to satisfy, but uh, once you are given that, you immediately find a lower bound for the corresponding sequence of curves. So here we had seen that the number of rational points grows linearly in the degree, and in this case, by just applying riemann hurwitz you see that the genus will also grow at most linearly in the degree. So if you work out what it is, it is just the genus of the bottom curve, minus one plus one half times the cardinality of this uh, backwards complete set of ramified points, times the C, the C is kind of the constant that tells you that you have not too bad ramification over here, times the degree of the covering pi m. Yeah. Okay, but what happens in fact in most examples that we know is that you have such a set R and you have such a set S, which are backwards and forward complete, but they are also, uh, I mean, the set R is also forward complete and the set S is in fact also backwards complete. Yeah, and uh, I mean, there are some uh, nice uh, things going on over here. So this was first noticed by Lenstra. Uh, he somehow stated it in terms of some kind of uh, identity that you have to satisfy. And then if you want, you can see uh, this backwards completeness or forward completeness as uh, giving, given by uh, some structure on certain graphs and uh, uh, so that was kind of worked out later on by Peter Belen and uh, uh, Aluan and Pere. Uh, yeah, and in all examples, in fact, both R and F are both forward complete and backward complete. Okay. Um, so how would one uh, ensure such a uh, thing? Uh, I mean, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is this joint result together with Christoph Litzenthaler. It's um, a sequence of curves uh, uh, over prime fields uh, that, have, uh, that are given by explicit recursive equations uh, and that have, uh, have a positive limit, yeah, that are good. Um, so in fact, for many years, uh, people have been looking for explicitly given recursive towers over prime fields, and for decades, none was found. And um, me, myself, at the end, even I was very uh, convinced that such a thing might not exist. Yeah? Uh, so it, for me, it was a big surprise to see that it does, in fact, exist. And uh, uh, what's more surprising is, in fact, that it is uh, some very uh, easy, uh, construction. So this is some joint work with Christoph Ritzenthaler. Uh, so what you do is you take P1 and you take a point Q on P1, which is uh, uh, in FQ squared, but not in FQ. Right? And then you can look at uh, uh, the automorphisms of P1 defined over FQ that's kind of fixed this uh, quadratic point Q. Yeah? So you look at the isotropy group of Q, this will be, so the isotropy group of Q will be, uh, is a cyclic uh, subgroup of the automorphism group, uh, let's say of uh, PGL to FQ. Uh, of order Q plus one. Yeah, so this is what is classically known as a Singer cycle or a Singer subgroup, at least in the case of uh, GL2. 
Uh, and then you can uh, quotient out by this automorphism group. So you get a cyclic covering of degree Q plus one to P1 again. And of course, in this cyclic covering, how will the ramification be? So the point Q will be totally ramified, right? So E will be Q plus one. And since everything takes place over uh, FQ, and here Q can be uh, anything for now, it can even be a prime. You see that also the conjugate of Q over FQ will again be totally ramified. Uh, and then uh, by Riemann Hurwitz, you see very easily that these are the only two ramified points. Because yeah? you have P1 here, P1 here, and these two will already give you all the ramification. So if this gives you already all the ramification, you see that on top you have Q plus one rational points. So the action of this order Q plus one subgroup over here has to be transitive on them, which means if you look at uh, uh, rational points that you have up here, when you go down, they will be all collected over a single rational point down here. Yeah? And then, uh, so this is kind of the basic extension that uh, uh, we are looking at. So this map over here will be what I previously called the F. And then you'll have to find the G so that you have together with this F and G, you really have a, a finite ramification locus. So you have a finite backwards complete set R containing all the ramified points. And you also have splitting points. So you want a forward complete set uh, of points that uh, split in, uh, uh, the, the, that will give you, that will spl hence split in all the corresponding extensions. And I just need one more minute. And that's kind of uh, satisfied uh, very easily, namely uh, a simple observation is that, uh, so what, what will be R in this case for R, uh, let me say what you can take up here. So the inverse image of R up here, you can just take to be the set of all FQ squared rational points, right, that you have, uh, but not the, FQ rational points, right? And uh, you can figure out what is uh, uh, the R that lies under it, so which is F of R prime. Oh, sorry, yes, should be FQ, right? So you take all those points up here and below you will have some set that we will call R. And for your S, you will just take all FQ rational points up here and their image, so, sorry, S prime, and their image, what I had called S before, will be just uh, the single point that you have here. Let me say it's infinity, for instance, you can choose according the coordinates, so you will have just one point down here, right? So that will be the corresponding inverse image. And then what you want is, you want that when you go up and down, uh, the things stay uh, kind of invariant. They, want, they should be forward complete for the S and backwards complete for the R. And one way to ensure that is by choosing the G just in a simple way by uh, making it look a lot like the F, but you just compose it with an automorphism above and uh, uh, automorphism below. Yeah, so you take uh, Psi and Phi, uh, so psi will be an automorphism of uh, 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 the curve above and phi an automorphism of the curve below. And you want that R prime and uh, S and uh, all of them should kind of be invariant under those. Yeah? And one way to ensure that is you can verify very easily is that if you ensure that this R prime uh, is left invariant under psi, Right? And if the set S prime is also left invariant under uh, psi, and if the two sets R and S down here, so uh, are left invariant under phi, so if you have phi of R is equal to R and phi of S is equal to S, for, any, for uh, suitable choice of automorphisms, this will already guarantee you that the two sets are forward complete and backward complete, right? But now these conditions are very easy to satisfy because any automorphism defined over FQ will really uh, 
leave this invariant and we'll leave this invariant. Uh, to any automorphism down here, leaving this invariant will give you one condition. You basically want to, to have a linear map and from here you will get the condition. So you just have to check whether you can satisfy these conditions together uh, with the requirements that uh, you have a completely ramified, that you have a totally ramified point in all of those extensions. And you can check that this can indeed be always ramified and you obtain the following, that this can always be satisfied, so you obtain the following theorem. So if for Q at least three, uh, there is always an explicit recursive tower, uh, over uh, FQ for all finite fields FQ with limits uh, lambda lower bounded by two over Q minus two. Okay. So let me maybe point out that this does not work for F2 and F3. And also it's a quite bad lower bound. Yeah? So you see as Q grows, it goes to zero. It does not improve any of the known bounds. Yeah? That's the bad thing about it. Uh, the logarithmic lower bounds by SER are better than this in any case. Uh, but the interesting thing is it is explicit and there seems to be something special going on. Yeah, so a question would be, uh, once we know that these uh, towers over prime fields exist, um, can you find better ones? Can you find ones that work over F2 or F3? And uh, since there seems to be something special going on, Another question would be, is there a higher reason for what's going on here? Is, are these towers maybe modular in some sense? And so on. So I'll stop here. Uh, thank you. So if you, if, you, if you fix the finite field and you fix the carries the too if you fix the finite field and you fix the curve C0 and C1, this is a finite problem to find uh, all possibilities that have. And, and a long time ago, uh, Ali Maharaj did some kind of search. Yeah. Has this been repeated? I mean. I think many people yeah. have looked with like exhaustive search yeah. in families, but you kind of have to look for what you, you have to kind of decide a priori what you're looking for, yeah. and then you will find all candidates satisfying the conditions that you have. I mean, for instance, this condition that F and G are so simply related by just twisting with um, automorphisms that need not be the case for uh, all. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's basically, you need to know what you are looking for and then you will find something. And I mean, I myself did lots of uh, computer search and uh, I never came across a tower over the finite field with five elements even, which is already very small. So it's, uh, if Q is five, the extension degree will be six. There is indeed not much, but I mean, it's always difficult and tricky to program it rightly and to make sure that you really check all the cases and so on. So. I mean, even to verify that in the end you get a tower is not so automatically programmable. You can kind of see whether certain things are satisfied, but uh, those are kind of difficult to convey to a computer. But uh, I guess this just slipped all the searches, is my guess, which was a surprise for me also. I can speak loudly. How do you control the difference? Uh, so in this case, it's only tamely ramified. So there is not much to, uh, I mean, you ensure that, uh, uh, the, I mean, the ramification, the points that ramify will only be those in the set R prime over there. And all of them will be tamely ramified. So in this uh, inequality that I have wrote, the C will in fact be one in all the cases. So this is really a very simple tower. There is no wild ramification going on, nothing. I mean, it's kind of, for me, if someone would have told me a year ago such a tower exists, I would have said, no, if it would, then someone would have found it either by computer search or by just looking at this very natural covering. It's, uh,
So did I, this is really a philosophical question. Did I understand correctly that you, your view, or at least guess might be that for, for Q prime, that A of Q should still be square root of Q minus one? That's my guess, but I guess that like these recursive towers, they, they are kind of very special. If you want to kind of construct them, if you want to come up even with a modular construction that gives you something recursive, it gives you lots of restrictions. So it could be that this is the best you can do with a recursive yeah. tower, but I mean, if you forget about the condition of being recursive and having all the symmetry with the pyramid and so on, you could do much better, I guess, but. Uh, yeah, I guess that was really my question. I mean, if you believe Elke's Fantasia that these recursive towers are all modular in some sense, and you believe that the, the many points on the modular curves are really all coming from super singular points, I don't see how you're ever going to get, achieve that bound using a recursive tower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it might be something non-recursive in that case. It's... Okay, we have time for a final question. Um, is, it, is it known in theory that you can solve the, divi the decision problem in which you're given the, the C0 with the map to C minus one, and your task is to decide whether there exists some tower where you choose the, you, you form this fire product and take uh, component. Take uh, components I don't know and, of any reason. Decide whether there is a, there is an, uh, the, uh, an, a good, asymptotically good to tower like this. Yeah, it's an interesting question, but I don't know of any result in that direction. Uh, so my guess would be it's no one might have looked at it until now, but I, w I, I wouldn't know it. It's uh, not the question I had thought about before. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.